Please be seated. Good morning, church. Great to see you here. Uh, I came in and was very thankful for several things. I, I'm thankful for our tech team back here. Week after week after week, sir, thank you so much. Our worship team, as they lead us and uh, help us to express from our hearts what we... Well, a, a young person was asked one time what worship is, and they couldn't think of anything, and they said, it's, it's when you tell God what you like about Him. It's a, good, it's a good definition of worship. So we get to do that every week here. And you know what else I was thankful for this morning? I just thought of it. I'm thankful for these chairs. I like these so much better than those other, those other metal chairs. So lots to be thankful for this morning. So let's begin with a question that will probably divide the house. Okay? It's not a good day for division, but just for a moment. Okay? So uh, let me ask you the question. How many of you like scary movies, and how many of you don't like scary movies? Let's have a show of hands. How many like scary movies? Oh, come on. It's almost all men. I think I saw one lady back there, maybe over here. Okay, just how many of you don't like them? Oh, look, wow, wow. Okay, I expected more, more people who would be into all of that, but okay. Well, uh, I like mystery movies. I like those kind of scary things in a sense, but I don't like the ones that scare the daylights out of me. I don't, I don't care for those. I can find out other ways, right? So movies aside, there's a lot that scares us today. Uh, I wondered what it is that people are afraid of in 2024. So I did a little research. Here's what I came up with. Here's what various groups have to say. The Chamber of Commerce says that small businesses are most afraid of cyber attacks. That seems to be their biggest fear. Uh, Americans as a whole, as a nation, said their biggest fear is total economic collapse. And quickly after that was followed by the possibility of World War III. Uh, how about congregations? According to LifeWay research, pastors, when they were surveyed, said 70% of them said that their congregations are more fearful now than ever about the future of the nation and the future of the world, that that's what plagues them. Can you relate to any of these things? Uh, my wife and I think about not so much what we're afraid of at this point in our life as we do thinking about what kind of world will it be for our grandchildren. We have 16 of them, and they're all growing quickly, some into adulthood, many in college, and just thinking about what kind of a world it's going to be that they're going to inherit from our generation. Well, I wonder what it is that maybe Living Rock Church could be afraid of uh, this morning. Maybe one of the fears that has occurred to us is how are we going to pay for this building? <laughs> have you thought about that? How are we going to pay for it? Uh, we have been renting for more than 20 years, which is incredible when you think about it, here and some other places, hoping that the day would come when we could build our own structure. Well, now that that day is right here, right in front of us, maybe it's causing some consternation. Uh, we're going to take that vote in a few minutes and we're going to decide whether we're going to do this and commit ourselves to payments for years to come to pay off this facility. And maybe if we allowed it, this uh, whole decision about making a commitment could kind of paralyze us. It's like, wow, this is a huge thing. Are we sure we want to do it? Well, Max Lucado speaks to this, this issue of fear that we have. He says, fear is dreadful. It sucks the life out of the soul. When fear shapes our lives, safety becomes our God. And when safety becomes our God, we worship the risk-free life. Boy, there's great wisdom and insight in that comment. So we can play it safe, or we can embrace a risky future with some unknowns in it. And uh, we don't know what all is going to be involved if we vote yes. But at the same time... I think my perspective on it is that this is really a step forward for our church in the narrative that God is writing for Living Rock Church. That's how I view it. 
that God's story through us really isn't even about a building. It's that the building is a means to the end that God has for us, which is enlarged ministry into our community and literally from here out into the world. And if he's calling us to do that, then he will have the resources to help us get there and get in that facility as a means to his end. If, if he has this plan, if he has this purpose for us, then surely he's going to meet our needs as we go forward. And when we put our faith in Christ at a time like this, it, is, it has the effect of chopping down some of those fears that can lurk in our minds and in our hearts. Well, today my purpose is to point out to you and to me the resources that God makes available to us when fear is a possibility. God shows us what those resources are in the first chapter of Joshua, a familiar passage maybe to many of you. I don't want you to come there with me either on, in your Bible or your device. Uh, some of the verses will be on the screen as well. Uh, Joshua opens at a very pivotal point in the history of God's Old Testament people. They have to confront two huge challenges. They're on the, on the east side of the Jordan River, as you know, and they have to confront two huge challenges. One is a leadership transition. God says to Moses, Mo, or to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. And then he says to him, you, Joshua, get ready. You're going to be the new leader. The only leader that that generation of people had ever known was Moses. And now Moses is dead. He climbed up Mount Nebo. He got a glimpse across the Jordan River Valley of the promised land that lay out there to the west of him. And then he died, and he never came back to the people, as you know. And God appoints Joshua to be the new leader to succeed Moses and to take the nation into the land that he had promised. That is a huge challenge for God's people. Will they accept Joshua? Not to mention at all the challenge that it was to Joshua to somehow take up the reins of leadership at this critical juncture in their history. So I'm sure that some people in that day, and maybe Joshua himself, had some fears about whether this is going to really work. We just lost our leader at a critical juncture. The second challenge that they also have to face is now taking possession of this promised homeland that God is giving them. God says to cross over the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give you. So Israel had been living in the desert as nomads for four decades. They would pick up their tents and move to another place in the Sinai Peninsula where the Lord led them. And around and around the Sinai Peninsula they went for 40 years. They were truly uh, a, a nation uh, on the move. So now they're poised to acquire a permanent homeland on the other side of the Jordan River where they could settle their families and their children and their, their herds and begin to grow their crops. Maybe, maybe Living Rock Church can identify in a small way with what Israel had experienced over those decades. We've been a portable church for over 20 years. Setting up, tearing down. Setting up, tearing down. Several locations where we've met over those years, mostly here. Imagine, though, being a portable nation, <laughs> not just a portable church, where you have to pack up everything and move it to a new location and set it up again and wait for God to lead you to the next location. And so the, their challenge is to find out, are they really ready to cross over the Jordan River? Are they really ready to conquer and possess the land that God says he's promising to give them? Or will they allow fear of that to paralyze them? The Bible tells us that eventually they leaned into the promise of God and they, they went forward. They took the, the plan of God, and they, they followed Joshua, and they went into the land. And I would like to say to you this morning that just as they did that, that's the kind of thing we need to do as well. We need to lean in to the presence and promises of God, and we need to step into the land that God has given to us. 
Now, I realize it's a different era, a different context. It's on a much smaller scale. But listen, it's the same God who challenged them, who promised to them, that is our God today. And he has the same resources to give to us that he gave to Joshua and the people way back then. So that's the point of connection that we can make, is that we have the same God who gives the same resources. So I want this morning to focus your attention on those resources for a few minutes. And I want you to think of them as faith-building resources. And what are they? Well, the first one that comes to mind in the passage, it pops up right away, is the promise of God. I will give you every place where you set your foot, just as I promised Moses. Notice that this promise that God is saying to Joshua has continuity. He first gave this to Moses and told them about this land, and God is saying in so many words, I made this promise to Moses, but it didn't expire when he died. It's still good. It still continues on. It's just as valid today. Now, when you and I buy certain kinds of products, you have this little warranty card that comes with it, right? And you're supposed to fill it out. How many of you actually, I won't ask for a show of hands, actually fill it out and send it or go online and register the product? Most of us probably don't do that. But I've noticed over the years there's two kinds of warranties. One warranty kind is that it's only good as long as you own the product. Ever notice that? It's only good to you, the buyer. It's not transferable. But there's another kind of warranty, and maybe some of you have that in your cars or other products that you own, where the warranty transfers over to the new owner. God's promise here is the second kind. He made the promise to Moses, but it transfers over to Joshua and to the next generation of people. It's still valid. It has never gone out of effect. So it's a continual promise. Uh, a continual promise. And secondly, God's promise is very specific. He, we won't go through it all, but in verse 4, he lays out the boundaries of their new homeland. Here's a, a little map to show you what it looks like. Uh, it's from way up north to way down south, from east to west. You can see the part that they actually took is identified in the center of the map, and then the larger section that goes around that is what they were actually promised, and the only king who ever got close to taking all of that was Solomon. It was in his day that they took almost all of that land and controlled it. But here's the deal. Every word of the promisor stays in effect. The only thing that's changed is the promisee. Joshua is the promisee, and the promise of God is still good to him. Now, do you think that when Joshua heard that from the Lord, do you think that that increased his fear, or do you think that increased his faith? I would say most definitely. It was a, it was a chopper down of fear, and it was a faith builder. It lifted up his faith. No doubt it boosts him to go forward in faith. So how does this little verse itself and that idea of a promise source our faith? How do we get something from that? After all, we're not Israel. We don't have a, a promised territory that's permanently ours. Well, uh, those specifics in the promise are not the point. What they were to rest their faith on was not simply the map. They were to identify and rest their faith on the character of the one who made the promise. So the promise of God rests on his character, on his power, on his strength. And that is what we put our confidence in when we take a step of faith today. We put our confidence in the character and the power of the living God. He is the promiser. He gives us his word. He keeps his word. He fulfills his promises. He's that kind of God. He doesn't break them. He doesn't go back on his word. Aren't you thankful for that? That you have a God of that kind of character? We simply are not smart enough ourselves to figure out the future. We're not powerful enough to control it. But our God is. 
Here are some verses that remind us of God's ability to keep his promises. Many are the plans in a person's heart, the Proverbs say, but the Lord's purposes will prevail. People can plan what they want, but it's the Lord's promises that will prevail. And this promise was made to the church, to the, to the believers in the New Testament. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God will carry out his work in you, in your life, until that day. And then a longer passage that James gives us when he says, Now then, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, your boast is in your arrogant schemes. All your boasting is evil. God always has a plan. He always has a purpose. And it's better than yours, better than mine better than ours collectively. We don't really know what all God intends to do through us in that property, do we? We can envision some of it, we can have an idea, but we don't know really what it is God wants to do through us. I do know this, it's going to be better and greater and more wonderful than anything any of us can plan. That we can be sure about. And here he's calling his people to recognize that he has his hand on the future And for us today, God is still the sovereign God. He's still the protector. He's still the redeemer as he was in Joshua's day. So we can confidently try, test his character, trust his character and his power. And that means that we should lean into the promises of God because of who he is, because of his character. And we know that God is going to provide what he calls his people to do. He always does that. He provides what he asks us to do. So that's one resource we have. All right. The second resource is his precepts. This is found in another verse a little later on where God says, Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. And then it goes on to say, Do not turn from it to the left or to the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and you will have success. The book of the law is where God's precepts were revealed. And that was the, in that day, that was the books of Moses. And uh, so God is telling Joshua to obey everything that that Moses had written down from the Holy Spirit's guidance. No turns to the right, no turns to the left, go straight ahead. Joshua was to be a straight arrow leader. He wasn't to take the people off this way or that way based on his own thinking. He was to go forward based on what the Lord had revealed. Now, Note that this obedience to the book of the law is more than just a rote, robotic obedience to a set of rules. What does God say? He says, I want you to meditate on the book of the law night and day. I want you to chew on it. I want you to contemplate it. I want you to let it soak into your thinking so that your mind and your heart is deeply affected by my word. This isn't just an external rule book for you. No, the law of God is to be internalized, taken in. And if you don't do this, anything less than this is going to take you into failure. So we know that Joshua built his life and his leadership around God's precepts. He leaned into the truth of God's precepts. He made his decisions and dealt with sin, and he dealt with rebellion, He dealt with the enemies of Israel. He divided the land and and did all of these things and taught the people the revealed will of God as it was found in the book of the law. Moses, or Joshua, based his life and his leadership on the book of the law. And that obedience to God's precepts 
gain them prosperity in the land and a blessed life for the people once they were able to take possession of it. If you wonder, did Joshua deviate from the law? Did he go this way or that way? Toward the end of his life, he gives his farewell address to the national leaders. And he includes these words in his last address to the nation. He says this, be very strong, be very careful to obey all that is written in the book of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. So now years later, Joshua is saying, this is what has guided me. Don't deviate from this now as you go forward. It's nearly verbatim what the Lord had told him. And it was genuine because he had based his life. They knew that he had led this way for these years. And we know that God intends that every generation, every generation would hold tight to the word of the Lord their God. So this shows us that God's precepts are a resource to our faith. We even have an advantage. Think about this. 3,400 years later that we live than when Joshua was alive. We have access to the full written revelation of God, don't we? We not only have the books of the law, we have the prophets, we have the wisdom literature, and we have the entire New Testament. We have the whole, what's called the canon of Scripture. We don't have scrolls locked away somewhere where nobody can access them. You have God's Word available to you in print. You have it available on your devices. We have access to God's Word like no generation before us. We have access to everything He says. And yet, and yet, greater access to God's Word doesn't mean that we're obeying it, does it? It doesn't assure us of greater knowledge, of greater obedience. For our leaders here in our church, thankfully, they lead us according to the Word of God. They take in the Word of God, they meditate upon it, and they teach us the truth week after week after week, not veering off to the right or to the left. They're going straight ahead. And so I just want to say to those of you who are leaders in our church today, keep going that way. Keep giving us that resource of your example of being people of the Word and help us to be people of the book as well. And then for all of us, God's Word is for us a massive resource to our faith to meditate on the Word every day, to, to be in the Word, to chew on it, to digest it, to act upon what it tells us to do. This is what will keep us going straight forward in God's will without veering off, as so many have done in our day. Now, Paul wrote later to the church at Colossae, he said, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, not just let the Word of God be something you memorized years ago. Let the Word of God dwell in you, take up residence in you richly, Colossians 3.16. What that does, when we take in the Word of God, it chops down our fears, and it builds up our faith. And so we learn from it, we lead from it, and we then lean on it. And so today, the second resource God gives us is we're to lean into His Word. We're to lean into what He has to say. All right? So not only His promises, but His precepts, and now there's one more. And this one may be the most important of all to Joshua, and that is His presence. God says to Joshua in verse 9, Be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Why would God say, don't tremble, don't be afraid? Because that was a real possibility. <laughs> he could have been trembling. He could have been quaking in his sandals. But he didn't. And God says, don't do that because I'm always with you. So God's promise is perpetual. His precepts are powerful. But now his presence is is personal. I will be with you, Joshua. What do you think Joshua's greatest need was as he took over the reins of leadership for the nation in order to be faithful? Well, I can assure you it was not some vague confidence in the man upstairs or someplace over in the tabernacle where they 
priests could go and be in God's presence. What Joshua's greatest need was, was to know that God was with him all the time, everywhere he went. God never left him. And God knows that so well that he goes on to say, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Can you imagine what that must have meant to Joshua? Put yourself in his place for a moment. You're taking over after Moses. And God says, just like I was with Moses, I will be with you. Whew. What a relief to know that God is with me like he was with Moses. Moses walked with God. Moses was a great man of miracles. But now Joshua can say, God is with me too. I'm not alone. I will never be abandoned by God just because there's been a change of leadership. So when he's tired, when he's afraid, when, when everybody's looking to him for some answers, God is with him. And whenever it's the long night or in the heat of battle and everybody is worried about the future on this side of the Jordan or on the other side of the Jordan, it doesn't matter. God is with him. I would say to you, God's presence had to be the biggest faith builder that Joshua received. And we might say by extension, so it is with you and with me and with our leaders. <laughs> Do you know that in the Bible, God says 70 times, actually a little over 70 times, don't be afraid. He says it repeatedly. Don't be afraid. It's usually followed with these words, for I am with you. It gives a reason not to be afraid. If you're afraid of what's going on, or as many people were afraid when God appeared to them in some form, maybe with angels or whatever, God says, don't be afraid. And then he often says, for I'm with you. Here's the reason. We don't need to be afraid because God is with us. He's present with us. And those are among the most important words in all of the Bible. When God says to step up in obedience and not to be afraid, he adds this reason, because I am with you. You don't need to be afraid. We are not alone. We're not on our own. He's right here with us and in us in our day by the Holy Spirit at all times and in all places. Jesus even said to his disciples before he physically left and went up to heaven, he said, I will be with you to the end of the age. I'm really not leaving you. I'm still with you. Now, no one, no one can promise you or me a fear-free life from now until heaven. But it is God's presence over and over and over again that lifts us out of those momentary fears into a position of faith where we trust him more than we look at our fears. We lean in more than we lean away. Here's a statement by a pastor named Crawford Loritz who said this, do you think God would leave Joshua high and dry? No, if God has called you, he is with you. Courage doesn't mean that I'm not afraid. It means that I fear God more than I fear my environment. It means that I trust in divine resources more than the resources of man. And then there is this word, I think, of great wisdom that comes from one of my favorite authors, Max Lucado. He says this, The presence of fear does not mean you have no faith. Fear visits everyone. But make your fear a visitor and not a resident. Isn't that good? Fear will come. Doubts might enter your mind. Emotions might sweep over you. But at the end, you rely upon God's presence as your greatest resource. So as we cast our vote today, as we look forward to what the Lord might have for us, our faith is strengthened by these three great resources, God's promise, His precepts, and His presence. And I don't know what more, frankly, I don't know what more I could ask for to chop down my fear. <laughs> I've got what I need. God's given me the resources. I don't need to be afraid, nor do you, nor do we as a church. 
In fact, we don't need to just tiptoe forward. We need to advance. We need to step forward. And when we do, we can be sure that God will be there with us. And are you ready then as a congregation to lean into the resources that God has for us for the rest of our journey? Let me ask that question. I began with the question. Here's the question at the end. Are you ready to lean in to the resources that God has given us for our journey ahead? May God help you to have the right answer on that one. Even if you have a little fear, don't let it be the the control of your life. It's just a visitor. The resident is the Lord Jesus Christ and his power. Let's pray together. So Lord, we're not trying to just be cheerleaders today or kind of talk ourselves up into something. Um, We're really relying upon you. It isn't about how much we can impress one another or even about our resources. At the end of the day, Lord, this is really about you. And if you're not in this project, Lord, we have no hope. But if you are in this project, Lord, then there's nothing that can hold you back from writing your story through Living Rock Church. My prayer is, Lord, that you will take us forward, that you will take us onto this property, into a building, as a means to the greater end of your mission and your purpose to be accomplished through this congregation. For your glory, for your kingdom, for the glory of Christ. Amen.